Well, we are in Isaiah this evening, chapter 36. Isaiah chapter 36. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Helkiah's son, which is over the house, and Shebna the scribe, Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt. Whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all that trust in him. That's true. But if thou say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, he shall worship before this altar? Now therefore give pledges, I pray thee to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee 2,000 horses if thou be able on thy part set to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain, the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Look down at verse 15. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered in the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Well, we'll pray. Father, I pray that as we look at this challenge, that was more than just a challenge against Hezekiah, but really was a challenge against the Lord in whom Hezekiah had caused the people to trust. And God, may we see your faithfulness and may we see the flaws in human wisdom. And may we put our faith in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I kind of remember... Uh, this same location as I was reading for study uh, for this message this evening uh, as I was reading I was thinking you know I remember this location the Fuller's Field don't you remember the Fuller's Field one of the first things that that uh, we saw in Isaiah early on in the first part of Isaiah's prophecy remember when the king went to the Fuller's Field and Isaiah was sent there to meet him let's look, go back there to chapter 7 if you will Isaiah chapter 7. And remember, this is when uh, Ahaz, the son of Uzziah, uh, king of Judah, was going against uh, Uzziah's son. Look at this. Verse 3 of Isaiah 7. The Bible says, Then the Lord said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Sher Jassib. Remember that guy, a remnant? Sher Jassib, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands. For the fierce anger of Rezo is Syria, of the, of the son of Remaliah, uh, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah. Verse 7, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. And uh, then this is when God tells Ahaz, you remember, ask the sign of the Lord thy God. 
ask me something, what was Ahaz's answer? He said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Well, a few years later, there's a different king. One of two kings in the Bible that distinguished himself. What was one of the distinctives of Hezekiah's early ministry? Remember one of the things that Hezekiah did that none of the other kings had done? Yeah, he removed the high places. So here's a king who's different than the other kings because he removed the high places. Look at verse 7. Go back to chapter 36. And look at this disdainful comment that this Rabshika, who is a representative of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, has to say. But if thou say to me, verse 7, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar? Now I want to draw this evening a contrast between Ahaz and Hezekiah. I want us to see the difference between a king to whom God sent his prophet Isaiah and said, take remnant with you and tell him that there's a future, there's going to be a remnant. And tell him to ask me for anything. And so Isaiah did. And Ahaz's response to God's command to ask him for anything was, I will not ask you for anything. I'm not going to tempt you. I'm not going to tempt God. I'm not going to test God. Friend, there's a big difference, isn't there, between Hezekiah, between Ahaz. And that's what I specifically want to focus on and look at this evening. See, the destruction of Judah was worse, or the, the onslaught against Judah was worse in the days of Hezekiah than it was in the days of Ahaz. You see the difference in location? Remember, Isaiah went and stood by the king of Judah at the Fuller's Pool. But who is at the at the Fuller's Pool in Hezekiah's day? Rabshikeh is. In other words, the enemy is there at Jerusalem. And here's the little spiel he gives. First of all, he says, and he wouldn't, he refused to speak in in uh, the in the Syrian language. He spoke in the people's language. First thing he said is, don't trust Hezekiah. Now, this is a great tactic when somebody has confidence and blusters, but uh, isn't quite so much of a man in person as they are when the threat is gone. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know if you were much of a, of a um, typical schoolboy, some of you men here, but in, in, uh, when I grew up, uh, see, today we have bullies. Back when I grew up, we, we had bullies too, but we were all bullies because the deal was if everybody was afraid to mess with you, then you wouldn't get bullied. But if, you, <laughs> but if people weren't afraid to mess with you, then somebody would bully you. And uh, I'll tell you what, I remember junior high being tough, just tough, tough time. Uh, in my neighborhood, I'll tell you what, the, the, the popularity thing was going around and there were kids that just talked about being popular. And the way to be popular in junior high was to make fun of everybody else, you know. And so if you're the in crowd when they're there, everybody talks nice about it. One of the things that happened with all the kids on my block was if you were there, they were making fun of the people that weren't there. And when that person was there, then sometimes they would even switch. They'd go from making fun of, you know, for making fun of the person that wasn't there, but if the person that they made fun of was someone they were a little afraid of, then they'd make fun of you. And that's the way it was. But you could make people afraid to make fun of you, too. And that was usually a pretty good approach. I remember one time, a kid spread the word around that uh, he, he was a better wrestler than me. And so the word got around, and it got back to me. So I went and found him in front of a bunch of kids. I said, I heard you said you could beat me in wrestling. And uh, you know, I didn't say that. And all the kids said, yeah, you did. <laughs> so we wrestled right there. You see, he was a good wrestler until, until somebody, you know, was actually there. He'd say he could beat me, but he wouldn't say that when I was there. There are a lot of people like that. Well, this is what Rabshika is banking on here. He's saying, you know, Hezekiah talks a big talk about his God and how God's going to deliver him. But I'll bet you if I come and embarrass Hezekiah in front of the very people that he's trying to bolster their courage of, 
if Hezekiah loses courage in front of these people, then the battle is as good as won. And you know, it's a lot better not to even have to fight a battle if people will just surrender. That's the easiest way. You're going to lose anyway. You might as well just surrender. That was the logic behind Rabshika. But I want to look at the flaws in Rabshika's logic. The first flaw in his logic we find in verse 7 when he references Hezekiah's putting away the high places. He said, Hezekiah is going to tell you to trust in the Lord. He said, but is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar? Yes, it is. See, the, the area where Rabshika makes his grand mistake is he is trying to cow Hezekiah. And guess what? Hezekiah is afraid. But the one thing that Hezekiah knows is that if there's one to be feared between the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, and the Lord God, that the Lord is the one to fear. And now this man, Rabshika, makes a grandiose mistake in thinking that Hezekiah has destroyed the worship of the Lord, but in the truth, in fact, if he'd known the Lord, he'd have known that God said, they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. And that's in the context of the right place to worship God instead of the high places. You know about the high places, don't you? The high places were set up as convenient places to duplicate the worship of God. But the high places were never endorsed by God. And the two kings in, in uh, Israel and Judah who distinguished themselves from every other kings were the only two kings to ever completely do away with the high places. And now this has become a critique. See, I think Sennacherib has done his research. He sent, before he sent Rabshika, he said, find out some about, you know, find out some things about the political, religious beliefs of Judah. And I reckon he heard some, some murmurings or some rumblings, some rumors, that there were some people that were a little upset that under King Hezekiah, that they had to travel all the way to Jerusalem to worship the Lord because he destroyed their altars in the high places. He heard about that. And he said, oh, I'm going to put my finger on an area of unpopularity with Hezekiah. I'm going to put my finger on an area of unpopularity. But you know what that area actually was for Hezekiah? There was an area of great faith. It was an area of faith that had distinguished him and his relationship with the Lord from every other king in Israel except for one. And so where Sennacherib and Rabshika made their mistake was they overestimated actually Hezekiah and they underestimated his Lord. Now, I want us to look at Hezekiah and I want us to get a good view of him. In contrast with Ahaz, Ahaz said, I'm not going to ask anything from God. I'm not going to tempt the Lord. Look what Hezekiah does. Verse 30, chapter 37, verse 1, it says, It came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth. And he went into the house of the Lord. <laughs> now, does this sound like a strong, confident man? You know what a strong, confident man would have done? He said, Bub, you're in my territory. And you all alone. And Sennacherib may be a bad dude, but he's not here. And I'd have taken Rabshika and I'd have given him the business if I was strong and confident in my strength. If the people wanted to stand up to that man, they could have done something right there. But you know what Hezekiah did? Hezekiah said, wow, he's in our territory. He's right here at our home base. He's right outside of Judah, Jerusalem. We're in big trouble. And he went and he fell on his face before God. Verse 2, he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priest, covered with sackcloth, unto Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and of blasphemy. For the children are come to birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. Look at verse 4. It may be that the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshika, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to, Hezekiah, to Isaiah. Did you hear this? In summary, Hezekiah's message 
to send to Isaiah the prophet was, God, you've got a problem. God, you've got a problem. I don't know about you, Christian, but I'm going to tell you something. That's one of the most powerful prayers you can pray. One of the most powerful prayers that you can pray is, God, you've got a real problem. This man's blaspheming you. Like what different men of God have said in the past, I've, it's been many individuals have been quoted as saying you don't need to defend a lion, just turn him loose. They're talking about God's Word. They're talking about God. And that literally is Hezekiah's approach. See, this man Hezekiah, he seems a little bit like a chump. He seems like a little bit of a scaredy cat, but in truth, he's a guy who's actually very realistic about himself and who he is and about God and who God is. When I think of brave men, fearless men in the Bible, I think of men like King David. I think of guys like Joab. I'm going to tell you something. Joab was never afraid of anybody ever. Ever. I mean, I think of men like Jonathan. You ever, you ever read about Jonathan? Jonathan just thrills me. Jonathan's a man's man. He's a godly man and a man's man. But Saul's son, Jonathan, he says to his armor bearer, Hey, let me and you go up to the garrison of the Philistines. It may be that God will give us a victory. Let's go fight about 100 guys. Me and you. <laughs> and off they go. And they found him a little place. And the guy, he said, Now, if the guys say, You come up here and I'll show you a thing, let's go up. God will give us it in our hand. If they say, Wait there and we'll come to you, then we know we're in trouble. And they said, Come up. And they said, We're coming. I love guys like that, Jonathan. I'm just tell you something. Hezekiah wasn't anything like that. Hezekiah was no Jonathan. David, David's mighty men. David instantly regretted when he did wrong, but he was not afraid to cut the skirt off of Saul's garment. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, you talk about dangerous dude. David. I mean, here's Saul thinking he's in a private place all by himself. And David cuts the skirt off of his garment. And then goes out and makes fun of Abner. Abner! What kind of a general are you? You've been protecting the king? Check his skirt. <laughs> Think David was afraid of Saul? David said, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. That's the only reason he never killed Saul. Saul would throw a spear at David and he'd dodge. But he was never afraid. Hezekiah would have fainted in his boots. Hezekiah is not a man's man. He's not a brave man. He's simply an intelligent man. He knows what he is and he knows what God is. And you ask me what's better, a brave man, a courageous man, or an intelligent man that knows what he is. And I'll tell you every day, it's an intelligent man that knows what he is. Hezekiah got on his face. And he said, go tell Isaiah to tell God that he's got a problem. And so let's look at how it fell out. Chapter 37. Uh, Rabshika, Bible verse says, verse 8, So Rabshika returned and found the king of Assyria <coughs> warring against Libna. This is after God has sent a blast so that they hear a rumor. So in verse 8, So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish, and he heard say concerning Terhatha, king of Ethiopia, he's coming forth to make, he's come forth to make war with thee. And when he had heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah. <laughs> so God sent a rumor. God made Rabshakeh go away. But when he went away, he made sure to let Hezekiah know, you haven't won. Now here's the deal that, that was offered. See, this is a second strategy that the king of Assyria was using, which was a smart strategy. The first thing was to embarrass Hezekiah in front of the people and, and reduce the people's confidence in Hezekiah. The second thing he did was to offer him a deal that was a pretty good deal. Tell you what, you stay where you're at, you harvest your land, you plant your land, you harvest your land, and I'll let you harvest it and keep the fruit off of it. You can just stay where you're at and keep things how they are. Everything can be just like they are. And then later on, 
If I come and take you, I'll take you to another land just like yours and give you what you have there. Worst case scenario wasn't too bad. Best case scenario, you stay where you are and you never move. Nothing ever changes. That's what most people want. Most people don't want change. They just want to live their pitiful, miserable existence out the way that it is with no hope or expectation of ever, things getting better just so long as things don't get worse. It's amazing the situations people will stay in just because they're afraid to change. And so, <laughs> then, that was the offer. If things get worse, I'll take you to a land that's just like what you're at now, but at least you'll be alive. You'll be together, and as far as your living situation, it's going to be exactly the same. That's a pretty good offer, actually, isn't it? That's not too bad for a people that has conquered militarily. But the challenge was, what will God do for you? What can God do for you? Well, in verse 10, here's his second response to Hezekiah. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of, king, of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the children of Eden which were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad and the king of the city of Sepharvim, Hena and Iva? And so he sends Hezekiah this message to say, don't trust God. Don't trust God. Friend, Ask yourself a question. If you don't trust God, who can you trust? The fact of the matter is, is that many people put their faith in horses and men and strength. Many people trust in things other than God. Many people trust in God's small g other than the Lord God. But the reality of it is, is that there's only one God who is actually trustworthy, and that's the Lord God. And here, Reb Shika is making a grand mistake. Oh, he's done his research, hasn't he? He knows the politics of Jerusalem. He knows how upset people are that Hezekiah has put away the high places. But one thing he's wrong about is God himself. See, first of all, he's wrong in thinking that God didn't want the high places put away. God did. And the second area he's wrong about is thinking that God couldn't deliver Hezekiah and the people of Judah from him, and God could. So here's Hezekiah's second response. Verse 14, Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. What did Hezekiah do the second time? First time, what did he do? He sent a message to Isaiah. said, tell God he's got a problem. This time he's got a letter. And the letter was addressed to whom? Yeah. Him. And he said, God, I, don't, I think I got your mail. <laughs> they sent this to me, but I think it's for you. And he spread it before the Lord. He just took his problem. It was, a it was a physical manifestation of the problem. And he just spread it out to the Lord. And he addressed God, the God whom he knew. Here's what Hezekiah knew about God. He knew first that God was separated from man. He was higher. He was above. Verse 16, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. He knew that God was separated from man. He knew that the gods that Rabshikah and that Sennacherib had been responsible for overthrowing were small, g, fake, man-made gods, but he knew that the God that he worshipped made man. And there's a big difference between a man-made God and a God who made man. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent to reproach the living God. And he said, God, he mentioned you. God, he said that you could be beaten just like any other God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their countries. He said, God, you know, he did, they did do what they said and have cast their small g gods in the fire. But he said, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, 
that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord hath spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high? Even against the Holy One of Israel. By thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord, and hast said, By the multitude of my chariots am I come to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof, and the choice fir trees thereof, and I will enter the height of his border, even the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk water. So he goes on in verse 30. The Bible says, And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same, and the third year sow ye and reap, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruit thereof. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a blank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Hezekiah said, well, what about me? It doesn't matter about you. I'll save it for my sake and for David's sake. You know, my friend, I think that sometimes we appeal to God on the basis of our own reputation. God, if you don't do this, I'm going to look bad. And God says, who are you? You don't see a protest from Hezekiah here. Well, God, you know, I mean, I put away the high places. At least mention me with David. No mention of Hezekiah here. But God said, I'll do it for my name's sake. Friend, I want to remind you this evening that what motivates God is not His defense of your pride. What motivates God is His holy name. And many times we try to appeal to God on the basis of, God, I've got a problem, as though God needs to defend us and our problem. And you and I would do far better to realize if it's not a problem for God, it's not a problem for me. But if it's a problem for God, then God's got a problem. Did you hear me this evening? If it isn't a problem for God, it isn't a problem for me. But if it is a problem for God, God has a problem. And God can take care of His problems. So God said to the same people through Isaiah, He said to the same people that Rabshakeh had said, go ahead and plant your vineyards and you can harvest them. And later on, God said, you go ahead and plant your vineyards and harvest them because I said so. Plant them this year and eat the fruit. Plant them next year and plant them the year after. There's going to be a remnant in, in Jerusalem. There's going to be a remnant here for my name's sake and for, da for David's, my servant's sake. And as far as Sennacherib goes, he can leave the way that he came because I said so. My friend, that was good enough. It was so. We'll look at the rest of Hezekiah's life later, the way that he distinguished himself, the ways that God used him. But I think one of the most helpful things about Hezekiah for me is that he wasn't, I don't believe, exceptionally brave. He was just exceptionally intelligent and knew who he was. Why was Hezekiah king of Israel? Because he was a descendant of David. He was born to be king of Judah. Why did God deliver Hezekiah? because of God's holy name and because of His servant David's sake. And you know something? That's good enough, isn't it? God doesn't need to do something. God, for my sake. Really? Who are you? The real question is, who is the Lord? If you want to learn how to pray, you're going to have to learn how to pray things that you know God wants. And you want to learn how to think straight, you need to think the way that people who know the Lord are. And this man, Hezekiah, is a model when it comes to praying to the Lord. Father, I pray that you would help us to learn from this prayer in the Scripture. I pray that you would strengthen our faith in you, not only your ability, but God, and the reality of what matters to you. For your name's sake, Father, we pray these things that you'll help us to understand. In Jesus' name, amen.